yeah. and Microsoft as well. Yeah. And it's really a great example how um, uh, theoretical breakthroughs and developments in tensor um, computation and other aspects can also be delivered to the public and uh, let us enjoy those uh, properties in our products, in the GPUs that we are running, mm -hmm. and so on. Uh, so, yeah, we are glad to have you yeah. and, uh, uh, yeah. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you, Ellie. Um, thank you for having me here and uh, had a great day, uh, you know, talking to students, faculty, and there's such a uh, diverse group of topics uh, being tackled here and I think the applied math has always been at the forefront of thinking about interdisciplinary and broad application areas and connecting them to basic foundations right and that provides a great inspiration for how machine learning should also bridge those uh, you know, different areas from all the way from foundations to so many areas of applications and still have a common language across all of this together. And today, today I'll try to attempt uh, to cover a range of topics, uh, but the theme that I want to ask is, you know, we've had great uh, performance gains in the last few years when it comes to increase in accuracy using deep learning methods, right? They've been great for supervised tasks, you know, fixed benchmarks, you look at accuracy. We've gotten uh, huge strides in performance. But for everything else, it's still a long way away. So how do we go beyond that, incorporate existing structure, domain knowledge, uh, have better interpretability, reduce bias? So how do we do all this uh, to make uh, deep learning be practical uh, in real world use cases. So that's the broad theme. You know, parts of the project that I'll show you have been done at Caltech. So some, uh, you know, topics are done at Caltech, others are done at NVIDIA. Again, these are all um, published or uh, will be soon published. So you can have more details. So I always want to start a talk on uh, AI and machine learning with this idea of Trinity. Because when we think of uh, machine learning, we usually think of just the algorithms, right? Everybody is asking, what algorithm are you going to use in this application? But almost in so many settings, that's not what we should be asking, right? What we should be asking is, what's the kind of data you have? At what scale do you have? What is the quality of this data? Who annotated this data? How confident are you with these annotators? So all these questions can have a huge impact, and we should be worrying a lot about the data. And the third facet is also important, right? What kind of compute infrastructure do I have? And now with our data growing uh, in enormous amounts, and also these models getting bigger, what the aspects, uh, you know, how do we parallelize computation, how do we scale them up, and what are the uh, right programming frameworks that can help us get these models into production easily and quickly. So these aspects are dealt much more in industry, but now are also, uh, you know, aspects that are coming into academia, right, because we are now having to grapple with large-scale uh, computation. So it's important to take all these three together in an integrated fashion. And also compute will become uh, an important aspect if you're doing robotics or other edge computing applications where you have limited computation. You have to do it on this device with battery and other constraints. How do you do this well? And how do you still have uh, uh, good uh, performance guarantees? So it's always good to ask on any problem you're tackling, what is this picture of Trinity and do they all come together holistically? Because if one piece of the puzzle is missing, right, most likely you will not be successful in what you're hoping for. And with the deep learning revolution, right, the idea was these three ingredients uh, came together in a very synergistic manner. Um, so neural networks have been around for a long time, ever since the 50s, uh, but uh, until um, recent times, there wasn't enough data or compute, 
right? So when there was excitement about neural networks in the 80s, you know, even the world's most powerful supercomputer was less powerful than our iPhones now. So that growth in computation has been so critical in order to have these large scale models and large amounts of data be processed. The other has been the creation of internet, right? Like now with uh, cases like, uh, you know, ImageNet and other data sets, you could easily glean off the web and then have annotators label them and get these large benchmarks. And that was a critical piece to having enough uh, supervised data to get these deep learning models to work well. And so these three put together have uh, been very successful for you know, computer vision, language, speech. There's been big performance strides. You know, doesn't mean they're solved problems. They're far from solved problems when you put them to real applications, but it has been a leap, right? And that's the exciting part. And so today what I want to ask is, how do we deal with applications where we may not have this data? You know, so I think here in the audience, many of you are looking at problems in different scientific domains. You know, you can't expect data of the scale of ImageNet, right? At least in many settings. And so if not, what else do we have? We don't have all the data, but we have priors and structure and all kinds of additional knowledge. We also have existing methods. You know, if you're running simulations, there's all kinds of simulation methods, both exact and approximate. How do you use all that knowledge and existing technology, right? And what deep learning is currently saying is throw all that away, just give me the data. And to me, that's not the right philosophy for many problems. And so the question is, how do we intelligently make use of priors, right? So when I say priors, you know, it could be in a Bayesian sense or could be not, right? So prior could be some form of knowledge and structure. And how do we integrate it with data, right, is the algorithmic design. And we have to be very mindful and careful about that. So that's the broad thinking that uh, I want to put here. And now the question is, OK, what kinds of priors? What should we think of as priors? Right, so for instance, uh, I'll show you an application where we show improvement of drone landing and flying. For, you know, in that case, we don't have to reinvent laws of physics, right? So if we just purely gave the data and not told anything about Newton's laws of motion, right, that's just wasteful, right? So we already know this. What we may not know is certain parameters of external forces, these so-called ground effects of aerodynamics, that's hard to model. So what's hard to model is the one that needs to be learned from data, but what's a good model that's already known, or even a approximate model that's already known should be put in. So you can think of like using all kinds of physical laws if you're dealing with data that's from some physics applications, right, or some other you know, natural applications. So that's one form. Um, the other is you may have just use simulations themselves. As I said, in uh, many of like PDEs, quantum chemistry, all these calculations, uh, there are so many varying degrees of approximations made, so you have simulations of different fidelities. The question is, how do you use that, and how do you use real-world data together? And we are just beginning to ask these questions. Right? In the uh, area of robotics, uh, the question of uh, what we can do in simulations well and what we need to go and do in the real world, right? That balance needs to be figured out. Um, in fact, at NVIDIA, Seattle lab here, uh, you know, Dito Fox runs the lab on robotics and there uh, the focus has been uh, how much high fidelity simulations we can do on GPUs and do that at scale so we can get a lot more data and simulations. But there's always going to be imperfections and it's never going to perfectly model the real world. So how much should we go and like, do the experiments in the real world? You know, think of the example of a robotic arm. It learns how to grasp all these objects in simulations very well, but then in the real world, there will be changes, right? It won't exactly be the same. And how much do you close the loop and go back and forth? This is broadly known as sim to real and back to sim sometimes, right? So uh, design of algorithms that can take into account these kind of domain shifts, as well as 
you know, requirements. You know, in robotics, we want stability, safety, all these guarantees in addition to just good learning accuracy and performance. So how do we build in requirements as well as domain uh, uh, knowledge together? I think that's where it's a much more holistic design. Uh, so there couldn't be other forms of uh, structure. Um, in a, another project, what we asked was, can we think of compositionality? You know, like the standard approach to deep learning is have one big neural network, feed in all the data, get the answers. Right? But in so many cases, it's not even one objective or task. We'll have multiple objectives and tasks. And this compositionality, we are always putting in simpler models into more complex ones. Right? That's how we do in other areas. And we should bring that philosophy into learning as well. And in a project we did, which I won't go into the details here, but you're uh, free to look up more um, on my web page, what we asked was, if we have to uh, have the uh, machine to learn math, you know, not through pre-programmed approaches, there's already Mathematica, everything where everything's perfectly programmed, but what if it has to learn with a mix of some data, so you're giving the values of functions at uh, different points, but you're also giving symbolic rules and expressions, right? There's axioms in math. We can give that, and we can give some data. How do you combine all that together and do this in a compositional way? You know, if you're now composing and operating multiple functions, there's a notion that you have to have networks that are dedicated to different functions, but they also interact together because you're composing groups of functions together. So those aspects are also like kind of going beyond this monolithic one neural network, one task, let's run optimization and get to a good answer. Uh, so that's the other aspect of, you know, what are the domain knowledge? Can you write that down in terms of rules, axioms, inequalities? How can you bring that in? Right, so that's an interesting uh, place. And then in terms of structural uh, priors, in many cases, graphs are natural. You know, if you have like uh, relational data, it's very natural to say like, you know, A is related to B through a notion of, a re you know, there's an edge that relates them. And you see that in so many applications. If you're doing program code analysis, you know, that's uh, an area where there's a lot of uh, excitement because, okay, ultimately we want to replace programmers, but we are, Nowhere close to it, right? And then the meanwhile, we can start asking, can we make it easier for people to program? You know, you can start with something as simple as autocomplete as people are programming, or you can like pick bugs, right? You can do all these aspects to make it easy for people to program and find bugs. And for that, you wanna understand how is this program structured? And thankfully, uh, most programming frameworks also give you the computation graph. They give you like a syntax tree. They give you all kinds of you know, relationships amongst these variables, and you want to be using that. Uh, and that's where it's actually different from natural language where those annotations are very hard to get. Right? So depending on the program uh, problem domain, you may have all this graph information that's very useful. Or you may want to discover graphs which you know are underlying uh, structures that can make the problem much better posed. And so graphs are natural in so many settings, and how do we uh, design neural networks that incorporate graphs? There's this whole family of graph neural networks and things built on top of it. And aspect that I'll focus on today is this idea of uh, tensors, which uh, uh, you know, can, is another way to uh, think about what kinds of structures you want to impose in neural networks. Right, so the promise of a neural network is, you know, if you have enough neurons, uh, it can model any function, right? It's a universal approximator. But the question is, okay, if you only have finite capacity, finite data, the more structure you build in, right, the better generalizable it is, the more robust it is. Uh, so you have to build in this, and I'll show how tensors can offer a good, uh, again, inductive bias and good way to come up with compressed networks still maintaining uh, generalization abilities. So that'll be the first aspect I'll focus on tensors and then move to some of these other examples of how to have drones land efficiently with using both the combination of learning and uh, physical priors 
uh, and I'll give you many other instances as well. So any questions here before I dive deeper into these topics? Great. So let's now look at how tensors can help us uh, take learning to new dimensions. So what do I mean by that? Because uh, all of you here are aware of tensors, but still, you know, dogs are always great to explain complicated math. Uh, I'm kidding. But uh, the idea is tensors are extensions of matrices to more dimensions. Right, so a point is zero dimensional, vector is one dimensional. Um, matrices are two dimensional, by which I mean there are rows and columns, but it's more than that, right? A matrix is more than an array, it's also a linear operator. You know, you can transform uh, matrices, you have the notion of a spectrum of a matrix, right? And this is all like the foundation of linear algebra. And so, all, so many algorithms, you can trace it back to linear algebra because of all these fundamental properties of matrices. And the question is, how can we extend that to more dimensions? What is the notion of uh, what a tensor operator is, right? And uh, what kind of transformations you can do on tensors? And what does it bias that matrices don't have? Why are these more powerful than matrices? In what instances do we, can we harness that? And what are the pros and cons, right? So well, matrices versus tensors, what is this picture? So that's what I'd like to address first. I mean, indeed, it's natural to think about tensors because the data we see now is multidimensional. Right, so images, you can think of them as three dimensions, the width, height, and channels, right? If you also add the batch, it's another dimension. If you say video, time is another dimension. And so the data we find these days can be multidimensional, multimodal. So it's natural to encode this data as a multidimensional array. So even as you're having this as an input to a model, right, we are encoding them as tensors. So this is natural, right? Because the data itself is structured as multidimensional. But you can also think of the use of tensors <coughs> when you think of higher order statistics or higher order moments of data. So even if I have X as just a random vector, it's only one dimensional, right? So each sample is just a vector. Uh, when I think of higher order moments, tensors are natural ways to express that. Because if I look at pairwise correlations, I can express it as a matrix, right? So each entry here corresponds to the pairwise correlation of different uh, entries of my random weight, uh, vector. So xi, x, x, j, if you look at its correlation, that's represented by an entry here in this matrix. And so that presents a natural extension uh, to more dimensions. So, you know, if you now look at uh, third order uh, uh, tensor, uh, you now look at the triplet uh, coefficients of every combination, right? So you have like, what's the correlation of entries xi, xj, and xj, xk, and that's some entry in my tensor. So this is a natural way for us to express higher order correlations and higher order moments. And so that's why tensors can be very powerful. So if you look at, hopefully it ends soon, okay. <laughs> so, you know, if you think about principal component analysis, uh, the idea is what you're doing is you're looking at your covariance matrix and finding low rank components of it, right? Like what are the principal eigenvalues and directions, eigenvector directions of this. And now you can think of doing similar things with also higher order uh, moments, and that can give you different directions from just the uh, principal directions of pairwise moments. And so that's the idea that higher order moments can reveal more interesting uh, aspects of your data. And if you make some underlying assumptions of what the data is distributed as, that could even reveal right, parts of the model of the data. And so that's how I got introduced to tensors because the question I was asking was, if I wanna learn about uh, latent variable models, so these are models where there are hidden variables and you don't have supervision, right? And that's why it's so hard to discover them. And with matrices, there's only limited aspects you can discover with pairwise moments, 
right? You're effectively making a Gaussian approximation because if you're only using moments up to pairwise, uh, you know, order or second order, uh, you're making a Gaussian approximation, right? And that's why PCA is so limiting. Even if you had like few outliers, PCA is very uh, susceptible to that. So all kinds of issues PCA has. And so one natural generalization is if you now go to higher order moments, what more can you get out of it? And what we showed in our, one of our first papers was that you can discover all kinds of latent variables and you can learn latent variable models efficiently. And I'll show some examples a bit later on what aspects there are. So that's something to keep in mind that tensors you know, are natural if you want to represent multi-dimensional and multimodal data. If you want to capture higher order moments on your data distribution, again, they are natural structures. Right? And if you impose low rank and other assumptions on that, in a way you're creating information bottlenecks for these higher order statistics. So there's nice principle reason of why to incorporate tensors. And uh, as I said, now the question is, what kind of operations do you do on tensors? So for matrices, matrix products are, is the primitive, right? Once you have matrix products, you can build all the other linear algebra algorithms. For instance, if you recall the matrix power method, which finds eigenvalues and eigenvectors, what you're doing is you're multiplying the matrix with a random vector and repeating that again and again with normalization, right? So that's why you know, this, you know, defining this primitive is important. And so the natural generalization of matrix product to more dimensions is called the tensor contraction. And basically the idea is now you're contracting the tensor along different dimensions, right? I showed a special case here where you're contracting with vectors along different dimensions. And you can see pictorially here, right? You're kind of combining uh, uh, these uh, coefficients across these different dimensions. And that's why there's like this multilinear operation that happens with tensors. And so with this building block, we can now ask how do we design algorithms on top of that, right? So that's a nice generalization of now matrix products to more dimensions. Uh, and one thing we showed in our paper was you can like, you know, analyze tensor power method similar to matrix power method, right? You can multiply a tensor with random vectors. So if it's symmetric, you even use the same vector in the two dimensions. Keep repeating this again and you ask, what are the convergence properties? Uh, what kind of eigenvectors do I get? And it turns out they'll be very different from what a matrix would give, right? So there's optimization properties we can analyze and we can ask, uh, you know, what do I recover in terms of the underlying latent factors? And so once you can define the primitive, you can build a whole set of algebraic operations on top of that. And so this is the other building block uh, for uh, tensors. So given all this, uh, you know, we asked, uh, with respect to neural networks, how can we use tensors effectively? And as a beginning step, uh, you know, as a simple kind of starting point, what we asked ourselves was, if you look at convolutional neural networks today, right, there's convolution operations, there's max pooling, you reduce the dimension. And then when you come to fully connected layers, you lose all that three-dimensional structure, right? So you're just taking like activation tensors from convolution layers, just flattening them into a vector, learning fully connected weights and doing some layers of that and coming up with answers. And so one natural question was, if we went beyond and designed tensors in every layer, what would that look like? And what we decided was to replace these fully connected layers uh, where the three-dimensional information is lost and instead keep the three-dimensional information throughout but now design weights as tensor contractions. So you're learning separate weights along these different uh, dimensions. And in the last layer as well, you're doing a tensor regression where you can design low rank weights and come up with ways to compress in a global fashion in these layers. And so the idea was, what do we lose by you know, now uh, learning these weights across different uh, dimensions and what do we gain? Right. So what we showed here was it's all gain, right? So there is a free lunch. So meaning you can save, 
in terms of the number of parameters, so you get a high compression ratio. You save as much as 65% of the parameters in these fully connected layers, but still have the, almost the same accuracy. Right, so the idea is now you can have much more compact networks with the same level of accuracy as these large uh, networks with just matrix layers. So tensors can help us come up with these compressed networks without losing accuracy. And the reason they're able to do that is they're uh, capturing the inductive bias in data. Right, in this instance, the inductive bias was, you know, I'm operating on three-dimensional data and the convolution preserves the spatial nature, but the other layers previously weren't, right? But keeping track of that helps me much better in getting the same accuracy. So again, a very simple instance of this, but we'll see a lot more you know, things you can build on top of that. Uh, there are works since then where people have also used tensor uh, representations in different layers across multiple layers and come up with good rates of compression. So ultimately, we can think of like this giant network as a tensor, right? And now within this algebra of uh, uh, tensor representations, what's the appropriate one? So we can come up with good principles to ultimately do architecture design and go into operations beyond just matrix products in these neural network layers. And that can help us come up with uh, you know, much smaller networks and better generalizability. So that's the uh, idea with this. So any questions here? Yeah. Here's what happened from the stack of images on the previous slide. That's from step two to step three, I guess. If that's just tutorial or something specific happens, we'll go. So this is, this is just like from convolution layer to fully connected layer. I just want to represent that. Oh, okay. that's max pooling. Okay, okay. Just to represent, like, oh, there are many layers of convolution, and there's some max pooling. In the next slide, so when you use uh, like tensors instead of linear uh, layers, for example, like the tensor you have yeah. yeah. So it, uh, in each um, like axis, you're going to use one uh, weighted matrix. Like instead of using WX for a linear yeah. layer, for each of these, you're right? Going you're using to multiple. multiple. Yeah. And then in the last layer, we are also doing a tensor regression where we represent the weights as low rank, low rank Tucker form, if you know the, the different forms. So you're already training everything in a compressed way. So that helped us get compression. And since then, there have been works that showed like you can combine this with quantization, get a lot of you know, compression gains. So there's all these other techniques you can combine with and uh, get best of all the worlds, right? So there's potential to do that. So the next aspect I want to show is uh, with respect to when it's uh, unsupervised learning, how do you use tensors? And that connects to the uh, earlier comment I made of how you can look at higher order moments in data and discover latent factors. Uh, for instance, topic models have been very popular where uh, the idea is you want to like extract topics from documents. So you're given a document, you want to like learn what the topics are, right? But this is unsupervised. So you don't have documents with these labels. You just have the text you want. You don't know anything else. You want to learn what the topics are. And so popular model there is called latent Dirichlet allocation, where the goal is, given these latent topics, uh, how do I automatically discover them from data? And this is where we use this notion of tensor decomposition, where we use third order moment of data. So we looked at how triplets of words co-occur in a document. Right, so the idea is word occurrences should be telling something about topics, but it's really groups of words that tell me about the topic, right? So for instance, in the previous slide, you saw like if it's justice, there are indicative words like, okay, there's police, there's witness, there is crime, right? Uh, and then if there is sports, you have like indicative words. But sometimes words could be ambiguous. If you just look at one word, it's not clear if it's a, or if which topic is occurring. But if you have groups of them, you have that indication. And we exploit that by looking at decomposing this third order moment 
of word occurrences. And if you look at the most energetic directions, meaning we are looking at uh, the uh, largest eigenvalue directions here, you can get informative topics, right? Those are the dominant topics in this document corpus. And this is something uh, when I was at Amazon, help deploy on the cloud at scale, so you can uh, you know, run very large set of documents uh, and do that fast using these tensor methods. Yeah, okay. yeah. So I mean, indeed, indeed. All right, and the, and that's a choice to be made because the question is statistically and computationally it gets harder with more dimensions, right? And uh, uh, in most cases, what we found is just going to order three from order two is already a big difference because many of the properties remain the same order three and beyond. So the big change happens from two to three because linear becomes nonlinear. Right, so that's a big jump. And then after that, sure, the, you know, the, uh, as the order gets bigger, it exponentially gets harder, but the qualitatively, the properties remain the same. So two to three is the big jump. Great, so that was like with uh, unsupervised learning. Uh, the third uh, instance of uh, use of tensors I wanna show is uh, forecasting, I know many here I was talking to, right, are interested in time series, and it, this is a hard problem, especially if we wanna do long-term forecasting. If you wanna go way into the future, you know, all kinds of higher order correlations would come into play, right? And there's error propagation. If you get this wrong now, how do you forecast all the way to the future? Once you get it wrong, it's wrong, right? But if you have uncertainty, how do you maybe keep track of that uncertainty all the way into the future? Right, these are hard questions, and that's why this is challenging. And the question is, what kind of sequential models, right, uh, can be useful here? And the standard approach so far has been recurrent neural nets, right, which is first order Markov, and how do you uh, just kind of, you know, in the unrolled form, all that's saying is there's some hidden state, and you're propagating that forward. So the challenge with this for long-term forecasting is, Everything that you send to the future is only through this bottleneck. And so unless you make that very big, you cannot propagate all the required information, right? But if you make that big, you tend to overfit, you don't have enough data, you kind of you know, are not getting good performance. Uh, and also these models tend to be too big in that case. So instead what we said was we'll take a window of data, right? So this is now a higher order Marco model. So you're looking at essentially the higher order moment of these hidden states. But then that higher order moment is too big. You don't want to train weights on that raw higher order moment. Instead, you want to find low rank representations of that. And this is where we use this tensor train framework, which essentially means there's a low rank bottleneck at each stage. So as you try you know, go from one step to the next, uh, you come up with these bottlenecks. And so you can now kind of train this end to end. So you're now designing these networks with low rank tensor representations in them. And you can go to higher order Marco models and the idea is you can make them more powerful than first order Marco. And what we see uh, in this case is, you know, we looked at traffic and climate data sets and what you see is this tensor uh, LSTM models uh, uh, are uh, much more graceful in their error degradation for long-term forecasting compared to baseline LSTM models, where the error just shoots up very quickly as you ask for longer-term forecasting. So this, you can think, for a lot of forecasting problems will be very applicable. And recently, we also extended this to video prediction, right? So the challenge now is you have very high-dimensional data in each frame, and you want to forecast what's going to happen in next uh, 20, 30 frames and so on, right? And this is extremely challenging. And what we've shown so far is even with, you know, simple data sets. So this is something known as moving MNIST where you have MNIST digits moving over time. And, uh, you know, if you want to like kind of learn to predict way into like 38th frame, this is the ground truth. <laughs> Even the state-of-the-art models, these predict RNN and those models just tend to fade away, right? It just doesn't know what to do in the long term and there is this fading effect. 
And uh, this baseline is a convolutional LSTM, which is nothing but your convolutional layers, and then you have an LSTM sequential model. And even that just misses out, right? It doesn't kind of, you know, look at how these transitions happen. And what we've seen, like, you know, this, I won't discuss the details of these variants, but what we saw was this tensor train models, especially this version of it, was that it can capture much better and sharper even these very long range predictions, right? Like even up to, you're going to 38th frame, you're able to learn what this pattern is. And uh, in this case, indeed, this is a deterministic simple pattern, right? Uh, but this shows like as a proof of concept that these models have the capability to learn these long range patterns, which first order Marco models don't. And if you're doing NLP research, there's a lot of like, you know, advances in transformer models, which are also essentially looking at these higher order statistics, but they're just putting all of them together. Whereas we are like designing careful bottlenecks at different, you know, uh, transitions. And so there are ways to bring them together and we are thinking about that. But the idea is, right, you have to go beyond like standard LSTM RNN models if you have to go to long-term forecasting. Yeah. Is there something special about NLP data that <laughs> just feeding a lot more data seems to be very successful there versus over here it seems like this kind of approach? Um, just the fact that this is so much more high dimensional. So if you have to do like a BERT-like model on video frames, you'd need <laughs> massive. And even for NVIDIA, that's too much. <laughs> right? I mean, people have been trying like these video BERT and others, right? But it's, it's just the variations are so much more and the space is so much bigger. Uh, that's why I think that's not the answer. And even for language, I don't think that's an answer. That's an intermediate answer, but we'll hopefully get to a place of where there's ways to capture long-term dependencies, but still have ways to keep that interpretable and have ways to not overfit, right, to and make have spurious correlations. It seems like you're exploiting low dimensionality that exists in the right. video. Right. Um, as opposed to, I guess, you're not about dimensionality of Even there, there is potentially, right? I mean, the word embeddings already show that you can embed them into this low dimensional space. Indeed, you know, how we think of meaning of words, this, you know, it is a low dimensional manifold for sure. But how to discover that is hard. Yeah. Yes. Yes. So this is right now simple. It's deterministic, right? So, but you have to start there. You know, then you can ask, okay, if there's probabilistic transitions, can you keep track of all the uncertainty? Can you, like, you know, is it able to generate different candidates? That's the next step we'll be working on after this. But. Mm -hmm. Right, so it's uh, it's right now deterministic. It's not kind of having periodicity. It's like some, you know, pre like kind of a fixed uh, aspect of how they transition, uh, and we are not incorporating any periodicity in the model, right? So the idea is, can you kind of discover that from correlations, which is more challenging? Yeah, because indeed in these simple examples, you can come up with other contrived models that can work well, but then they won't generalize, right? The idea is to have this as a proof of concept with the hope that it'll also generalize to more complex video frames. But that's great points. Any others? Just to so these models, the original tensor yeah. models, uh, will be like multi-layer LSTM. Yeah, so I hit the details. There's like, you know, multiple layers. There's also the question of what is the window size? This is actually sliding window. The other was fixed window. So all these like architectural de details of how to so kind of put them. Yes, indeed, answer. indeed. So that was the baseline convolutional LSTM and then you add this on top, right? So the idea is there is certainly a difference in using tensors and that's what we see. Um, and the other important aspect is there's big compression ratio. So the, you know, you're getting best of both the worlds. You're certainly getting better video quality with a smaller model, right? So people think just go bigger and bigger and you get better results and that's not true. Right, so in fact, for better generalization, you should have smaller models. It's just that in many cases, we've had such a hard time training small models because we haven't put in the right inductive bias. 
So it's important to think more of how to kind of design the right architecture, right structures to incorporate that. And in fact, there's like this, I don't know, this 3D LSTM model where compared to that, it's a huge compression ratio, right? But even with respect to the baseline, we get like compression ratios. So that's uh, what we found interesting. So you don't have to go to big models. So, so those are aspects of tensors that I think are great. And if you want to work with tensors yourself, we made it easy for you. Like Jean Kosefi, who's been a close collaborator of mine, uh, created Tensorly, which uh, you know, makes it possible to just, you know, the, all these different tensor operations are available, like different tensor layers are available. So you can use that with different backends. I know it's most easily used with PyTorch, but you can also use with others. So the idea is you can start developing. And also it's open source, so contribute to that ecosystem, and it would be great to have all that in one place. Is it, or is it hardware specific, like something? No, like just, you know, like it's all these different backends on any hardware. And it's really like as simple as just kind of, you know, defining this tensorly and defining what kind of tucker, you know, tensor representations you want in the layers, right? And the rest of it you run as in any standard uh, deep learning framework. So it's kind of makes it now easy to start experimenting with tensors in different ways. And the other aspect, you know, I won't dive deep into that, right? So far, I only talked about, okay, this is great. These are small models now. These give better generalization, better long-term forecasting. But what about the computational uh, aspect? You know, do they become less or more expensive for computation? It turns out they're great for GPUs. Right, because when you're doing tensor tensor operation, that's a higher order blast operation. So with every increasing order of blast, you get more parallelism and hence more efficiency. And in fact, QTensor is a library that's uh, getting launched by NVIDIA that will speed up tensor contractions and all these higher order operations. So ultimately, you can envision also getting hardware speed ups. Uh, you know, to a much bigger extent. I mean, there's already hardware speed up because you have smaller networks, but you can further accelerate it because you know these computations of higher order that can be much more, much better parallelized on frameworks like GPUs. So that's the other aspect which more people in HPC and you know numerical algebra and those communities deal with. But I think there's nice synergy, right? Like of how all this comes together. So given that uh, you know, I'm uh, running out of time, maybe I will just pick a few like, topics rather than all of this. So I don't know how to maybe. Uh, it's, it went to completely something else. Where, oh. Never mind, that seems too hard to do. Sometimes there's like a display here and okay, it came now, okay, okay. Um, so you know, there is like a notion of like how to detect hard examples, but I will skip that in the interest of time. If you're interested, I encourage you to go check that out. Uh, but I think for people here, the control aspect of it will be interesting. So I wanna show this quickly. <coughs> That works. OK. So the idea is you know, how we can put learning in the loop with control systems. And here, you have to worry about safety, stability, and all these other requirements. right? You can't have you know, a deep learning system fly aircrafts. I mean, given that this is a boring lecture, I had to say that. <laughs> I mean, even with a little bit of automation, forget learning already, there has been so many issues right, that Boeing is grappling with. So we have to be so careful when you bring in aspects of automation, learning, especially human in the loop. It's so complex. So given that, OK, how do we proceed? And so we wanted to do this for uh, landing drones more efficiently. And now, you know, adding like a part of the residual if you can learn better with neural networks, right? So in model-based control, the idea is you have a model for how the state evolves, and based on that, you design a controller. 
But then if your model is wrong, you would have a large amount of unmodeled disturbance. And so that's where it may take a long time for the you know, controller to uh, converge, or it may never converge because your model is wrong. So you have to, in order to um, grapple with those issues, you can say, I will now, you know, put uh, another function approximator using a neural network to take account the residual. So you know, this part of the model-based control can come from laws of physics. You know, that we did like bench tests on drones. We know certain all these coefficients that can go into like you know, modeling the forces. But there's the ground effect that's very hard to model because that's the aerodynamics. And so we'll instead treat that as a residual effect that we'll learn using a neural network. OK, we can do this. We can just put a black box neural network and go ahead with this. Right? And in, in fact, we did, and the drone crashed. <laughs> right? So yes, yeah, certainly no, don't try it on an aircraft. So the question is, OK, if we ca can't just put a standard neural network, what more should we do? Right? And why is this happening? I mean, this is happening because of domain shifts. Right? You can train it on some data you've collected. Um, and in fact, we have very precise OptiTrack uh, abilities at Caltech, we have this drone arena, we can get very precise data. But even then, you cannot completely cover its mode of operations, right? The drone can fly in uh, other like kind of uh, settings than what you've uh, trained on, and so you have to have additional stability requirements. So you want the system to be stable and uh, be able to take into account any bounded perturbation in the input should only have bounded output perturbations, right? And in this case, we could do that with uh, a simple framework because we could say, let's make this overall system Lipschitz stable. And one simple way to enforce that is spectral normalization, right? In, uh, and indeed, in, if we go to higher dimensions, you know, this was using just like 13 dimensions. If we go to like vision-based control, we would need more sophisticated techniques of trying to handle stability. But it already made a huge difference to spectrally normalize the layers of the network and hence have a bounded Lipschitz constant for the neural network. And that's what we see here, right? This is the conventional neural networks where it could even be crashing in some instances. And you can see if your training domain is lower speeds than your testing domain, you're now trying to land at faster speeds than what you trained on. It's just not at all graceful, right? So you kind of don't have uh, any trust in the system anymore, and it can lead to crashes. Whereas if you do spectral normalization, the stability ensures that it's much more graceful uh, in terms of how the function evolves as um, uh, you uh, go to even higher speeds than what you trained on. And now we are also asking, can we do automated safe exploration? Can the drone itself like automatically decide what's the safe velocity to land and continuously keep increasing the velocity but still be under uncertainty bounds and you know, train itself to be better and better, right? So that's the ultimate thing we want to do. But in this one, even the aspect of like simple regularization techniques made a big difference. <laughs> and this is the outcome <coughs> that appeared in ICRA this year. The idea is the neural lander is the one where we added the residual term with neural networks. The baseline is just the standard controller. And you can see that this gracefully landed, whereas that kind of went on and on for a while. So there you have like this graceful and faster landing, and still you have the you know uh, guarantees of stability, which is good. And you can also do more sophisticated aspects, like you know you can go like kind of do close trajectory tacking and do very precise, uh, just few inches off the ground, and you couldn't do this with the standard controller. So, so these are aspects that machine learning can add. But we have to keep in mind all the safety and stability requirements needed for this. Yeah, so it, this is the Center for Autonomous Systems at CAS. That's the drone arena I was talking about. We even have wind testing facility. We have bipedal robots. We have a space lab. So all these are my collaborators at Caltech who do exciting research you know, in these labs. And then I 
collaborate with them to ask what are the appropriate machine learning techniques. And it's, uh, that's how with this interdisciplinary research, we can look at making advances. And these are some of the Caltech faculty who are part of CAST. And you can see they come from so many uh, different backgrounds and expertise. And I'm really uh, proud to be part of this. And uh, indeed, if you are interested in postdoc, faculty, student, all kinds of positions, uh, you know, we are uh, Caltech, uh, we are hiring in uh, different areas. And in CAST, it's very interdisciplinary. So uh, feel free to explore uh, the uh, website and look at all the projects that are happening. So I guess I have just a few minutes in the last one I want to show. Yeah, anyway, that's the last one. I know I was talking to several people here who are, who are working in neuroscience or computational neuroscience. So the last part of the talk you know, asks, how can we come up with models that are more you know, for me, it's inspiration from the brain. I'm not claiming this is anything like the brain because it's so far from right, uh, what human brain can do. But the aspect we wanted to bring in was, right, like how do we combine prediction and generation together? So in standard neural networks, what we are doing is just prediction, right? We are going from a high dimensional input like an image. We are saying what's in an image like a dog, which is only low dimensional. It's only a few categories, and you want to classify. But if now I'm asking to generate, that's so much harder because you're going from like low dimensions to high dimensions. Oops. Uh, I think for some reason that was timed. I know this happens. So, and that's hard because of all the diversity you have to do and if to go the other way. What if you could do both together, right? And in the brain, in fact, right, the two are done together, right? Because what, again, my crude understanding of the brain is there's the feed forward network, there's the feedback network. And the idea is the feedback is, you know, ha already having priors in the brain and it's kind of trying to hallucinate and generate what's going on. And in the brain, all this are completely intertwined and uh, aligned. Whereas when we are thinking of prediction and generation, we are thinking of separate networks, separate algorithms, separate models, right? So why not try to put them together and to have a system that jointly learns to both predict and generate, and ultimately can come up with better predictions, right? Because what's, again, what my neuroscientist friends say is, right, what the brain does is also over time sharpen with the use of feedback, right? It's kind of like, because as we are going through these uh, temporal recurrence, we are sharpening, and that's how we perceive these, uh, uh, the world. And so with these inspirations, what we came up with is this model that we call uh, convolutional network with feedback. It's CNNF, so simple. And the main idea is there's the feed forward network, which is the standard convolution network. The feedback network tries to invert the layers of the network. But this is a non-invertible network, right? There's information loss as you've kind of gone from like these fine resolution to coarser resolutions and fully connected all this. So there's always information loss as you're going through the network. And so you cannot perfectly invert this. And that's why you want hidden variables. You want additional hidden variables to capture the uncertainty as you try to invert this. And uh, so that's the notion of feedback, right? So, and that's where you can incorporate all kinds of priors uh, here in terms of, OK, there is now I don't know exactly how to invert, but maybe my priors can help me in this inversion process. And I can learn like good feedback mechanisms to do that. And so we did this joint network, and this is this inversion, right? I already mentioned this. And we did this, and what we saw was, uh, you know, we trained just the standard MNIST, right? So it was what we trained was uh, clean data, and then we gave it a test time noisy and blurred and occluded data. So it's never seen these uh, degraded images. You know, and we humans can still work with this, right? So even with degradation, we can kind of squint and see, OK, what these are, right? So the idea is, can we expect neural networks to work on data it's never seen, right? The distribution has changed. But with the feedback, it knows what the generative model should have been. And so can it clean up and correct that? 
And that's what we did at test time. We did this temporal recurrence because with the feedback, we can run multiple iterations of it and we can clean up our images. And you can see that uh, it came up with much better quality images uh, without ever being supervised on this. You know, we never supervised on this task of learn to deblur or learn to denoise, but it's able to do that. And it's also able to get uh, much better accuracies than what a standard uh, CNN would do. And what you can see here is, uh, you know, with like kind of noise, especially with increasing noise, the uh, feed forward network would degrade significantly and we can get uh, better accuracies. And this is still, I would say, preliminary work because there are, we already know there are some optimization issues we can fix and make it better. But this gives us, again, uh, very good guidance on being able to uh, get uh, to much more robust uh, vision by using inspiration from the feedback mechanisms we see in uh, biological organisms, especially mammals. So, so that's where I think there can be very rich intersection between neuroscience and machine learning. And this is in collaboration with uh, neuroscientist Doris Hall at Caltech. And so I'm learning a lot every day on uh, how amazing uh, in biological brains are and how far away we are from that. But that's what I think uh, guides us towards better algorithms. So I'll skip this. And to conclude, so the main point I was, I guess the cursor is. So uh, the main point is really that, right, <coughs> Uh, for most applications, just black box, deep learning, and completely supervised is not the right approach or not the feasible approach. And how do we go beyond and add structures? And I talked a lot about tensors and how that can lead to good inductive bias to capture the multidimensionality of data, higher order correlations in sequential models, and still yield compression and better generalization. And uh, then I talked about how we can have safety and stability guarantees uh, in uh, control systems when we add learning and get better efficiency. So you're marrying control and learning in, uh, in getting an integrated approach. And I think, too, you know, question is, how do you have that right blend of prior knowledge and data right, that's so application dependent? Right, because for me, in control, what I want in stability, uh, in some other application, it's some other side guarantees. Right? So how do you take in that domain knowledge constraints and design the right mechanisms? Uh, that's the challenging one. And that's why, to me, that cannot be done without domain experts. Right? We machine learning people on our own will be in the blind. And we have to collaborate and understand closely what the other domains need, and uh, on, on, by only that way we can make progress uh, both in those domains as well as in coming up with better algorithms. Thank you. Yeah, so there were several <laughs> questions uh, during the talk, so we will, uh, if, if you have uh, additional questions, just uh, stop by and, uh, and ask Anima. And we would like to thank you for uh, yeah. Yeah, uh, visiting and giving yeah. such an exciting talk. Thanks. Thank you. So, yeah, there is a reception in uh, Louis Hall um, in the lounge. So.